The modern urban environment is literally swamped with electromagnetic energy from high tension power lines, transmissions from radio, television and other communications, to the wiring of our houses and of course the vast array of electrical appliances. Increasingly these days people are becoming concerned about the possible adverse health effects of the electromagnetic energy that surrounds us. To put this in its context, um, it has to be realised that electromagnetic energy is an, an integral part of our lives. Um, it's there naturally, it's the force that binds the molecules of our body together. It's something that's um, at the very centre of our being. Uh, we live on a, a planet which has its own electromagnetic field emanating from the molten core of the planet and we're bombarded by electromagnetic fields from outer space in the form of cosmic waves, uh, in the form of magnetic fields emanating from the sun and other solar bodies. So we're caught up in a strong network of electromagnetic energy. We stopped a few people on the street at random and asked them how their health is affected by sitting in front of television sets and computer screens. And after watching TV for quite a few hours that you feel quite drained and um, the plants that are around the TV don't grow very well either. Probably work uh, on average about six hours a day in front of a screen doing a lot of spreadsheeting and I guess fine detail you'd call it. And apart from a bit of tiredness, I don't really think that um, I have any adverse effect. I think maybe a lot of it's an excuse sometimes. <laughs> Increasingly with time, I'm getting more and more sensitive to electric magnetic radiation fields. The TV sets are one of the greatest enemies to comfort. It hits me right here. If I'm not back at least two and a half meters, over to the side by one, I just get bad nausea. The alarm clock that I have, digital, very handy, you can see it at night. When I get close enough to set it for whichever time I like next, I have to very consciously get back as far as I can, let it aim out that way, and then I stay back here because if I'm in front, it's, it's just too horrific a feeling. The fields that people are exposed to in, in typical city environments at least are millions of times higher, many millions of times higher, stronger than the fields that are naturally there without the sort of industrial exploitation. So once again um, we ask the question, maybe these fields because they're so strong, so much stronger than the ones that were where we've evolved naturally uh, with some protection from, um, maybe having some sort of effect, maybe somehow tweaking some of our biological systems that are sensitive to radiation at those frequencies and perhaps interfering with normal function. Well, they are. Um, this is true both of the ELF part of the spectrum, 50 hertz, and also um, the radio frequency part of the spectrum, which is about 100 kilohertz up to 300 gigahertz. There have now been several thousand studies in scientific literature indicating some sort of systematic, reliable biological effects on humans and other animals of relatively low strengths of these unnatural sources of radiation. Studies on living animals exposed to radio frequency and microwave radiation have reported changes to the immune system, brain function, cardiovascular system, as well as impairment in learning and exploratory behaviour. There are a few epidemiological studies uh, which look at human health, uh, changes in human health under various um, exposure conditions in city environments. For example, there have been studies of children who live in houses close to um, overhead transmission lines that carry very high currents and therefore are associated with very high magnetic fields. Similarly, there have been epidemiological studies of 
usually small populations, or usually adults in this case, living near um, radio and television transmission masts. Well, what these epidemiological studies show, although they are far from being conclusive because of the small populations that have been studied so far, is that there's some indication of an association between extremely low frequency 50 hertz fields associated with um, power distribution and, for example, childhood leukemia. It appears that there's an excess risk of about two for childhood leukemia in children who are living in houses for a significant period of time uh, where they're exposed to a larger than usual uh, magnetic field uh, because of their proximity to high current carrying transmission lines. My involvement with EMF fields came when a few years ago I read an article in an architectural journal on the effects and causes of EMF fields. I realised at that stage that as a child I'd slept through the back through the wall from the back of our black and white television set about that far away. The fields behind black and white television sets were incredibly high. They had no shielding like colour TV sets do today. Colour TV sets still do have a high field but nowhere near as high as black and white TV sets. So for five years I slept through the back of close to the back of that television. Um, I believe that that possibly caused me to have a brain tumour when I was 14. Four years later, of course, things take a while to grow and uh, it could have set it off. There's very high incidences of brain tumours and leukaemia in children from overseas studies. It seems very likely to me that was the cause. As an aura healer, I've noticed that most people who come to see me have toxins around their aura, around the throat, just here. This is particularly so for people that are using things like computers non-stop. There's a little vortex of energy here. It supplies prana, life force from the atmosphere into here, which feeds the thyroid and parathyroid glands. In an adult, the thyroid is responsible for the correct functioning of the entire endocrine system. When energy isn't coming into these glands because it's been blocked by a cloud, then we start to have malfunction of the endocrine system. Some other glands, depending on the sort of person you are, take over to compensate. It puts the entire hormonal system out of balance. Our endocrine system must work properly in order for us to be physically healthy, mentally and emotionally healthy. I've also noticed that when people are around a lot of electromagnetic energy, their thymus gland, just here on the sternum, is devitalized. It's only very tiny anyway in an adult, but it needs to have a certain amount of vitality to keep the immune system working properly. If not, one tends to have lowered resistance. Colds, flu, run down, tired, crabby. One of the other effects I've noticed is that when people are using microwaves, just looking at them, I go into a home, I see people eating microwave food, I notice that generally speaking, they have lowered energy levels. Microwave food is believed to create free radicals in the body that prematurely ages us. Some people say that it's cancer forming. The other effect that I've noticed on a personal level of electromagnetic energy is living too close to or under a lot of high tension electrical wires. It tends to create too much mental energy and it's not harmonious energy. It is agitated brainwave states. It makes people very, very quarrelsome in the home. It makes it difficult to get along with people because everybody's brainwave patterns are scrambled. On the plus side, I've noticed that if people come to me and they practice meditation specifically, yoga postures, breathing, tai chi, 
any of these sort of things. The blockages from the throat can be very easily removed. The thymus can be easily revved up. And when these people go home and they practice a little bit of these things, they're helping ward off such problems. Here's a typical cellular telephone transmitter site. Um, there's a lot of these through every major city. You can see the transmitters bolted onto the side of the bridge. And a person walking past might be exposed to significant radiation without realising it. I'm using an electric field probe here to measure the strength of the radiation field from the cell phone transmitters. When I hold it out over the side of the bridge, you can see that the levels are quite high, showing that the fields are quite strong. But when I bring it in behind the protection of the steel and the parapet, um, we're shielded from the fields. Out there in the, the playing area, um, there's no protection from the bridge, of course, and the fields are relatively high. This is a more typical cell phone transmitter in a city site, a freestanding tower with the antennas at the top. Um, up where we are in this elevated position, the uh, field strength levels are relatively high. You can see them changing with telephone usage. As we go down towards the transmitter, we're getting out of the beam and the levels are correspondingly falling off. If you have a look at the meter, you can see them going down. Um, at some point, at about 40 degrees below the antenna, the fields start to increase again. Um, they're doing it right now. And then as we move through that, they'll decrease again as we get right underneath the antenna. That's the normal pattern that you see around most cellular telephone transmission sites. The body has no voltage. It should be zero volt altogether. But studies have shown that uh, the body can withstand up to uh, 100 millivolt or up to 1 volt. On this case here we measure 10, 12 volts on here, on this here, 7 volts, you see, 6.6 volts on here. And we come around here, it's only about 3 volts, so 2.5, 2.6, all right? Now, I'm going to show you what's happened when an electric blanket is put on. We switch on the electric blanket now, on here, is about 55 to 50, 54 to 55 volts and you go down to 52 but look at this here now where the body is 100 and 506 volts the the body uh, biological system is supposed to have zero and you notice it went up to up to 105 volts this is an example on whole on whole electric blanket that people are using and if sometimes they come they get up in the morning with backache if they have uh, get up and they don't feel um, they can think well they can feel tired and um, sometimes they will feel very irritable and that could be one of the reason what I recommend for them to do is to switch off the, the, the blanket warm up the blanket before they go to bed and then pull the plug right out, out of, of the point. That means that there's no electricity coming through the, through the blanket while they are asleep. Although many laboratory studies have been carried out, it's still too early to conclusively confirm that there are any specific um, damages caused to human health by the sorts of levels of exposure that we get in a normal city environment. So what do we do in the meantime while scientific evidence is accumulating which might help us to make a decision about whether these things are really safe or whether they're dangerous? Well the answer usually is to develop a radiation exposure standard and efforts have been made to develop appropriate standards in many of the industrialized countries and uh, both the Western world and in the Eastern Bloc. And there has emerged from this effort a wide range of standards uh, which don't very closely agree with one another. For example, the protection standards in the Eastern European countries tend to be much more strict. In other words, they permit 
uh, much lower radiation levels than do the standards in most Western countries, for example, the United States, or for that matter, Australia and New Zealand. This graph shows how standards range from 3 microwatts square meter in Czechoslovakia to 30,000 microwatts per square meter in Australia, New Zealand and the UK. Why such a big difference? Well, unfortunately, the membership of the committee that's producing the protection standard for New Zealand and Australia, because it's a joint standard that's now being developed, is dominated by individuals who represent organisations that have a vested interest. Of the seven people that stand on the committee in New Zealand, Professor Ivan Bell is the only public representative. There is no one representing the general public of Australia. The public has very little voice on this committee. So it always comes down to a vote. And unless you've got balanced representation on the committee, as many representatives of the general public with as much voting power as there are representatives of people that have a vested interest, then the public are never going to get what they want. Now, at this stage of proceedings, a standard is being recommended which involves actually a relaxation of the existing exposure restrictions. If the standard is passed, then the population can be exposed to as much as five times the existing maximum permissible levels in important parts of the radio frequency range. But these are parts where we know that adverse effects are an issue. Well, we ask, doesn't the government have some say in what the Standards Committee does? Well, unfortunately, the answer to that question is no. Although at one time the Standards Organisation was um, part of the government and the government did exercise some control over its activities, um, in recent years of, in the environment of deregulation, the Standards Association has had to stand alone without government control and without government funding. The funding for standards committees comes from the industry. It comes entirely from the industry. So we have a committee whose members have been chosen by the industry with very little representation by the general public. Is it likely that they will come up with a health protection standard which is acceptable to the general public? I feel that, that historically it's always the, the private sector that are pushing um, for, for profits and so on and, and they, they're always pushing these standards um, and I think uh, really they, sh they should be based on some scientific evidence and they should, the onus should be on them to, um, uh, to prove that, 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 the, the, that the safety standards are being met rather than the other way around. Uh, I feel that what often happens is that uh, uh, safety standards are relaxed and then too late, 10, 20 years on, we find that, that, that they were wrong. And I, I really think it's, it's like a, a case in a court where you have to prove your case before you actually go forward with it. The industry doesn't see it that way. They say, well, if we haven't proven that those things would occur in humans, because there haven't been any human studies, of course, that would show that, and because we don't know whether it matters much whether people's memory isn't quite as efficient or they can't learn quite the same as they did before. Is that really an important health effect that people need to be protected from? The industry says no, but the public says yes. And I think in this instance, the public is surely right. This is pretty typical of the big firms as usual, doing these sorts of things and people not knowing what's actually going on around us. And for example, I worked for one of the firms you were talking about and I'm um, sitting in front of the VDU all day it really affects you, you get tired, you get really lethargic, your eyes are just falling out by the end of the day. And at the start of the job we actually signed a form and we read this big form telling us that it, was, it had been um, proven to be safe to be sitting in front of these VDUs all day and there was no problem, blah, blah, blah. But I don't know that I necessarily agree with that because from my own side effects I can see how it does affect people. I, I think just generally that, that people have to take responsibility for themselves and therefore it is important that people are involved in the process of decision making. That we have to be an intelligent and informed citizenry to participate in a society and in democracy. And there needs to be vehicles for us to participate in these decisions without things being imposed on us. If things are imposed on us then naturally we become suspicious, we be may become cynical, and we may not believe uh, that things are, for, are right, whereas in fact if, if we've been involved in the process we may have accepted 
the facts which are being put before us. The amount of radiation that, that's background radiation that's going on in the world today must be enormous and it must be having some effect uh, and, and we, we need to know just what and, and what the tolerance levels are if they haven't already been met.